everybody to Freedom Law School's annual 2009 Health and Freedom Conference Yay. on your <laughs> thank you and on your table each of you has this little booklet uh, which on it says citizen rule book and has a picture of three uh, patriots of the founding fathers era called the Spirit of 76's picture. So if you please pick up this booklet that you have on your table and go to page 26. And on page 26 of this document, we like to start this meeting. We start our freedom conferences every year with a reading a, a small part of the unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. So if you please follow along and read with me, we're going to read first the second paragraph on page 26, and then go from the bottom of the page, starting uh, four lines above the bottom, and continuing on the top of the page 27. If you please read with me to start this meeting today. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Please drop down to the bottom of the page, four lines from the bottom, where it starts with the word but. But, when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And folks, these words were uttered by the founding fathers, not after the revolution was won, but before the revolution was won. When it was still not clear whether the founding fathers, people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin and others, that their quest to return freedom to American colonists was going to work or was their blood going to be shed in vain unnecessarily. This is the kind of courage they had. And we don't start our meetings with the um, uh, allegiance to the flag, and I don't do that personally because I don't think the problem in America today is that American people are not patriotic enough, you know, for America. We don't see that as the problem. What we see as the problem in America that's going on is that our public servants in government, that they all take an oath to uphold and defend the U.S. Constitution and American citizens' rights from all enemies, foreign and domestic, too often, too many of them, especially at the highest positions of power and trust, like at the federal government level, knowingly and deliberately abuse and violate their oath to uphold the Constitution. And that's why America is in tr uh, trouble that it is today. And the current financial crisis that we're experiencing in the first Great Depression of the 21st century is part of that. So we start by reading from the Declaration of Independence to let everybody know the context of this whole meeting, what we're all about, why we do what we do, 
why these meetings are important to happen, and why the speakers that we bring to you during this conference are speakers that you want to hear and need to hear from. These speakers will bring you issues that really matter. They don't, we don't talk about sports who took one ball from this part of the field to the other. We don't talk about you know, the movie actors, actresses who's smarter, more beautiful, got better makeup. We talk about things that really matter. Your freedom, your family's freedom, your health, peace, and justice in your life. That's what matters to America. And so that's what our focus is all about. And this weekend, we have brought you a collection of the most uh, uh, knowledgeable people in their field of study, of health, freedom, and justice. And so I'd like to start by bringing you your first speaker. Uh, the first speaker today is on the field, is going to be speaking on the field of health. And the field of health, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, out there that we try to uh, clarify. Just like the field of freedom, the major media doesn't like to talk about these things because, as you'll see from the talk of, of our speakers, that the, the bankers that own the government practically, the major big banks like Citicorp, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and J.P. Morgan Chase, those are big four. They directly and indirectly control the major media as well. So the things that we are, want to speak about are, in this conference are politically incorrect. That's what they consider them to be. Well, we don't care about being politically correct. We just care, care about getting the truth out. And that's all that matters. And the truth will not get out without vigorous discussion and exposure of these ideas to the American people, which we need to do a lot more of. So our next speaker is an expert on the field of fats and cholesterol. You've heard a lot of uh, in the media, I'm sure, for the last 30 years, why you should cut back on your animal fats, why you should have a low cholesterol. Well, is that really so? Or perhaps not so? How truthful are these claims that you should have a very minimal amount of cholesterol and fats in your diet? Well, our next speaker is an expert on this field, and we'll ask him to come today and share us his knowledge and perspectives on this very important topic. Please help me give a warm hand of welcome to Mr. Chris Master John. Thank you very much, Payman. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. The, the monitor. Camera guys, help me with the uh, computer situation, please. Well, anyway, it's really great to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to talk to you today about animal fat. Animal fat is, of course, a very exciting topic, uh, not only because it tastes so good, but also because, contrary to popular belief, animal fat is actually good for you. And of course, it's a very um, appropriate topic for this conference because animal fat is really high in cholesterol, and this being largely a political conference, cholesterol is a very political molecule. So uh, the, uh, the panel who sets um, what defines high cholesterol, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, and so on in this country is the National Cholesterol Education Program. And this is a panel of the federal government constituted by nine physicians, eight of whom uh, are tied to the pharmaceutical industry. So we learned last night that, the, that Congress has given the Federal Reserve a congressional, uh, I mean, a, a monopoly on the right to create money out of thin air. And uh, the federal government has also given the pharmaceutical industry the right to create diseases out of thin air, such as high cholesterol, and the right to, uh, of course, make the pharmaceutical drugs that will treat those diseases. And then, of course, the federal government borrows money from the Federal Reserve in order to pay for those pharmaceuticals for the Medicare prescription drug plan. And new money enters the economy. The banks amplify it by the reserve requirement. 
and the value of the dollar goes down. So all these things are, are uh, very uh, tightly, tightly connected. So <laughs> I'd like to start out, of course, we're going to talk today about the, um, about the role of animal fat in health more than the politics of cholesterol. So I would like to start out by asking you to play a little word association game with me. So I would like you to say, you can just shout it out, what's the first thing that comes into your mind, the first word that comes into your mind when I say the word cholesterol? Lipitor, okay. Heart disease, okay. Animal fat, right? Yay. Okay, so delicious, right? Okay, so the typical person thinks of, th thinks of uh, heart disease and drugs that treat heart disease and so on. But uh, you know, no one said nutrient. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, perform a little experiment here and see if I can con convince you that maybe cholesterol is in some ways, at least for some people, a nutrient. Now, you never hear about cholesterol deficiency. Well, there is, in fact, such a thing as cholesterol deficiency. It's called smith lemley oppitt syndrome, or SLOS. And this is a rare genetic defect where the body uh, is not capable of synthesizing significant quantities of cholesterol. And we can get a sense of the importance of cholesterol in the body by looking at some of the symptoms that are associated with SLOS. Uh, and those include growth retardation and failure to thrive. They include a lot of symptoms that are specific to the brain and the nervous system, like mental retardation, autism, hyperactivity, self-injurious behavior. They include deformities of the face, hands, feet, internal organs, increased susceptibility to infection, skin problems, and gastrointestinal disorders. Um, so clearly there is such a thing as cholesterol deficiency, and uh, clearly cholesterol uh, plays a broad range of very important roles in the body, including in the brain, as you saw from all those central nervous system specific uh, symptoms. So the brain is only 2% of our body weight, but it contains 25% of our cholesterol. So you can see uh, that, the, that cholesterol is very important to mental function and brain development. Now the question that we need to answer about whether something is a nutrient is not just can we develop a deficiency of it, but is cholesterol provided in the diet capable of resolving some of the symptoms of that deficiency. And in the case of SLOS, it is in fact. As you can see from the list on the right of the screen, uh, cholesterol provided in the diet treats um, basically the entirety of the symptomology of this syndrome. Now, SLOS is a rare genetic defect that occurs in only about 1 in 60,000 births. But the reason it's so rare is because it's a recessive disorder, meaning you need two copies of the gene, one from each parent. And most of the time, a conception wherein both of those copies of the gene are present results in spontaneous abortion. So most conceptions that would have two copies of the defective gene don't result in a birth. Because of that, the rate of people who carry one copy of the gene in the population is much, much higher than you would expect. So in our population, about one in every hundred people carry a copy of the gene. In some populations in Eastern Europe, one in every 30 people ca carry the gene. And no one has really looked at those people to study their health in very much detail. But there is one study showing that these people who carry the gene so they have only a partial defect in cholesterol synthesis, that they have much greater risk of uh, suicide, especially violent suicide. Now that's consistent with the mental defects from smith lumley oppitt syndrome, and it's also consistent with other research showing that in the general population, low blood cholesterol levels are tied to the risk of suicide. So it would be reasonable to say that cholesterol is probably an essential nutrient for people who carry the defective gene which is at least one out of every hundred people, in the sense that in order to have optimal health and optimal function, optimal mental health and well-being, they need some cholesterol provided in the diet. And it's also reasonable to believe that there may be other genetic defects in cholesterol synthesis or other reasons for not synthesizing enough cholesterol that could be related to environmental causes, diet, and so on, that could also make cholesterol an essential nutrient for many other people. 
Now, I didn't know about smith lundley Oppitt syndrome when I was 18 and became a vegetarian. And it was this personal experience with vegetarianism and my personal recovery from that experience that led me to study, uh, to start studying nutrition in the first place. So now I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Connecticut studying biochemical and molecular nutrition. Um, when I was 18, I read this book by John Robbins called Diet for a New America. And in it, he argues that eating animal products, not just meat, but also uh, milk products and eggs and so on, is uh, cruel to animals, destructive of the environment, and causes disease. And in this book, he argued that animal protein causes leaching of calcium from bones and teeth, and animal fat clogs arteries and leads to heart disease. And that had been more or less consistent, at least in terms of heart disease, with what I believed. Um, however, the diet that I went on after that, a vegetarian, eventually a vegan diet, meaning I excluded all animal products, didn't work very well for me. And of course, not everyone has these same results because everybody's body is a little bit different and everyone has different sensitivities to nutrient deficiencies. But uh, in my case, I developed fatigue, digestive disorders that I'd had before got a lot worse, anxiety disorders that I had before got a lot worse. And uh, to top it all off, I went to the dentist and found out that I had over a dozen cavities and needed two root, root canals. Now this was a shock to me because I thought I would be immune from tooth decay uh, since I wasn't eating any animal protein, and it's animal protein that I thought leaches calcium from your bones and from your teeth. And of course, I was drinking a lot of soy milk too, and at least on the carton, it said that the soy isoflavones help promote uh, good bone health. So I figured they would promote good teeth, uh, dental health as well. So with all these dental problems, I was very interested when a coworker had shared with me uh, some information about Weston A. Price. Some of you uh, may have heard of Weston Price yesterday. Um, during David Gedoff's talk. Price was the first research director for what became the American Dental Association, and after working in that position for 25 years, he went on to travel all across the world to look at different uh, populations isolated from modern society who had immunity to tooth decay to try to study what the cause was of tooth decay, what was different in these societies from America um, which at that time, during the 1930s, 90% 90 of Americans had tooth decay. And he found populations all over the globe, not just in one area, but many different areas, that had not only virtually complete immunity to tooth decay, but in association with this immunity, they also had broad facial structure. They had broad palates that had room for all of their teeth, so they didn't have dental crowding. And they also seemed to have immunity to many other degenerative diseases that we wouldn't normally associate uh, with teeth, like cancer, for example. And uh, these people were very well-structured and, uh, and very healthy people. And he found that by studying people of the same genetic stock, either in the same family during a period of dietary transition, or people living nearby each other, and in one village there was a port and in another there, there wasn't, when these people started uh, displacing their traditional foods with modern refined foods, canned foods, and syrups, and so on, they developed not only tooth decay, but dental crowding, narrower facial structure that made it more difficult to breathe through the nose and made people have to breathe through the mouth, uh, susceptibility to tuberculosis, difficulty giving childbirth, cancer, and so on. And so he decided to study what's the difference between these people who have largely the same genetic stock. And in the people who had the excellent health and the excellent uh, physical and mental well-being, uh, they were eating very different foods in different societies in terms of the specific food, but they had very, uh, very much in common. They had diets that were very high in vitamins and minerals, and Price placed uh, special attention on the fat-soluble vitamins. Now, these people also tended to have uh, what you could call sacred foods where they considered particular foods to be incredibly important and critical to developing um, robust physical health, and in some cases were even sacred in a religious context. The most common of these was liver, which we're told by the American Heart Association to avoid because it's loaded with cholesterol. Another common, uh, another common set of foods was shellfish, another animal food. Uh, in the Swiss villages that he studied, uh, butter was the sacred food, and specifically the butter that would come in June, when the cows were eating rapidly growing green grass on very high quality glacial soil uh, in areas where the snow would melt, 
and the butter would be a deep orange color because of the high vitamin content, and they would consider this butter so sacred that they would uh, make a candle out of it, out of the first fruits from the butter, and, and offer the, uh, burn the candle on their altar as a sacrifice to God in thanksgiving for the life-promoting properties of the butter. So here I am, surprised, because I had always associated vitamins with uh, fruits and vegetables. But here I'm reading this information that everyone else, um, you know, all over the globe, be, uh, isolated from the modern ideas and modern society, is placing all this emphasis on these animal foods, the very foods that I was avoiding, because I thought that they caused disease. So why would these animal fats and animal foods uh, be so health-promoting? Well, mainly the animal fats contain the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, for example. Vitamin A was originally recognized before its molecular structure was discovered as that substance in egg yolks and butter fat that allowed animals to grow. And soon after that, uh, cod liver oil was also used as a source of vitamin A in experiments. So the foundation of our uh, understanding about, scientific understanding about vitamin A is founded on these three animal fats. And we know vitamin A is important for vision, that's what it's best known for, but vitamin A is also important in protecting against environmental toxins, it's important in protecting against childhood asthma, fatty liver disease, kidney stones, preventing oxidative stress, which is associated with many degenerative diseases, and so on down the list. Now, we typically associate uh, vitamin A with carrots, because carrots have beta carotene, which the body can convert into vitamin A. And it was thought at one time that uh, vitamin A and beta carotene were essentially the same thing. So H.P. Uman, who had uh, highlighted the problem of uh, vitamin A deficiency in the third world, which can be so severe that it can lead to permanent blindness, had said in 1978 that the whole procedure of vitamin distribution would be wholly superfluous if adequate carotene were present in the children's diet. In other words, they don't need actual vitamin A. If they just get the beta carotene from vegetables, they'll be all set. But we've been continually forced to revise our understanding of the conversion between beta carotene and vitamin A uh, to uh, continually recognize it as less efficient than uh, we had before. So in 1967 and 1988 both, the World Health Organization had said that for every six units of beta carotene, you get one unit of vitamin A. In 2002, the Institute of Medicine said, no, every 12 units of beta carotene, you get one unit of vitamin A. But Researchers soon after that ruling criticized it, saying, look, at, if you look at all these field studies, you're looking at an average of 21 units of beta carotene for every one unit of vitamin A. Now, the Institute of Medicine had also said that if the beta carotene is dissolved in an oily matrix like you would find in a supplement, you get two units for every one unit of beta carotene. But the next year, a radio labeled uh, tracer study showed that could track the uh, beta carotene as it traveled through the body showed that the real conversion factor was 9 to 1, not 2 to 1, on average. But if you look at each individual, it ranged from 2 to 1 to 20 to 1, with no connection to the vitamin A status of the person. So what this is showing us is that beta carotene is not only a poor uh, source of vitamin A in terms of the efficiency of the conversion, but it's also unreliable, because you don't know whether your conversion factor is 2 to 1 or 21 in the case of taking a beta carotene supplement. And if you look at the vitamin A content of the top five, uh, some of the top five plant foods and animal foods, and you use that lower conversion factor of 21 to 1 that the field studies suggest an average of, you can see that it's very difficult to get the vitamin A requirement from plant foods. If we just assume for the sake of argument uh, that, the, that the RDA for vitamin A is enough to meet your minimum requirement, that's 3,000 IU uh, for adult males and 2,300 IU for adult females. Now, maybe the optimal intake is higher than that, but at a minimum, that's the RDA. Now, we're looking at 100 grams of food, except in the case of high vitamin cod liver oil, that's a half a teaspoon. All these other foods are 100 grams. For some of the plant foods, that ranges from one to two to three cups, depending on the density of the food. So you can see that you're looking at two cups of sweet potatoes every day, or up to five or six cups of these red and, red and green uh, and orange vegetables in order to get uh, just the RDA for vitamin A, which is very difficult to eat for most people. Whereas, if you look at the animal foods, there are certain animal foods, like liver and high vitamin cod liver oil, that make it very easy to get the vitamin A requirement. If you ate liver once a week, then you would get the RDA for vitamin A. 
If you took high vitamin cod liver oil, half a teaspoon every other day, you would get the RDA for vitamin A. If you took half a teaspoon of cod liver oil, high vitamin cod liver oil, that is, every day, you would get almost twice the RDA for males and over twice the RDA for females. And if you consume a lot of eggs and butter, you can also make a substantial addition to your vitamin A uh, intake. Now, red palm oil might be the exception. Red palm oil is a plant food, and its beta carotene and other pro-vitamin A carotenoids are very efficiently converted to vitamin A because, one, it's in an oily matrix instead of a fibrous matrix. Two, it's really high in vitamin E, which promotes the conversion. And three, it's really low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, which inhibit the conversion. But we're told to avoid red palm oil because it's high in saturated fat, like coconut oil, all the tropical oils we're told to avoid. So we're told to avoid liver because it's high in cholesterol. We're told to avoid eggs and butter fat because they're high in saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, and we're told to avoid the tropical oils because they're high in saturated fat, which is a recipe for vitamin A deficiency, or at least a suboptimal intake of the vitamin. Vitamin D is another important fat-soluble vitamin. The RDA is only 200 IU for most adults. It goes up to uh, 600 IU, 400 IU after the age of 50, and then 600 IU after the age of 70. 200 IU you can get from sunshine because sunshine converts a relative of cholesterol in your skin into vitamin D. If you go out in your face and hands in the summer, you can easily get more than 200 IU of vitamin D from the sunshine. But research is suggesting that the optimal intake is much higher than this. One study of over 30,000 infants that were tracked for over 30 years showed that 2,000 IU provided in the first year of life could nearly obliterate the risk of type 1 diabetes. Uh, most researchers are now saying that 1,000 uh, or 2,000 or possibly even higher IU per day are needed for most adults to maintain adequate blood levels. Uh, and this is important not only for skeletal metabolism and preventing osteoporosis, but for blood sugar control uh, and for cancer and for many other uh, health points. Now, if we look at the foods that we need to get uh, this vitamin D from, we can see that it's, aside from some very obscure fungi, it's mostly present in animal products, spe specifically fatty fish and the livers of fatty fish. Uh, so if we're not able to get whole body sun exposure in a tropical climate uh, or um, uh, year round, then at least part of the year, we're, gonna, we're going to be able to need, uh, we're go going to need to be able to get vitamin D from foods and uh, we're going to have to get it from these animal fats. Vitamins A and D cooperate together, and they also cooperate with another fat-soluble vitamin, vitamin K2. Vitamins A and D tell, tend to tell cells what proteins to make, and often vitamin K2 is needed to come in and activate those proteins. This is important to uh, the deposition and organization of minerals in the bones, of te in bones and teeth, and vitamin K2 is also needed to prevent the calcification of growth cartilage, and that makes, uh, that makes it important for growth. Because in early growth, if your cartilage calcifies, then it's not able to extend and cause growth of the bone. Now, vitamin K2 contributes to the protection of soft tissues uh, from calcification in general, and that includes kidney tissues and includes blood vessels, which makes it really important to uh, preventing heart disease. Uh, so a 2004 study showed that high vitamin K2 intakes were associated with a dramatically lower incidence of coronary heart disease, of uh, coronary heart disease mortality, and of severe arterial calcification. And vitamin K1, which comes from leafy green vegetables, despite the fact that they were consuming nine times more of it than vitamin K2, had no effect. So this is a specific effect of vitamin K2 found in fermented foods and animal fats that is involved in preventing heart disease. And if you look at... Uh, if you look at animal products, you can see it's all in the fat. As you go from butter down to whole milk, down to 2%, 1%, and skim milk, you go from a high amount of vitamin K2 to lower and lower until you get to zero in skim milk. If you look at egg yolks and compare them to egg whites, you're looking at over 30 times as much vitamin K2 in the yolk. And if you look at the top foods, the top two are fairly obscure. Natto is a fermented soy food found in eastern Japan. Goose liver paste is another food rich in the vitamin that most people don't eat. If you look at the foods people actually eat, you're seeing most of it in cheeses and egg yolks, uh, and maybe some fatty cuts of meat like uh, goose leg. Now, how many of you, we get a show of hands, how many of you have uh, heard from a friend or personally experienced um, 
the doctor saying you have uh, high risk for heart disease, so you need to eat more egg yolks and hard cheese. <laughs> for those listening to the audio recording, no one raised their hand. It's not something that you hear very often, but nevertheless, these are the foods that people were getting the vitamin K2 in that study from who had this dramatically lower in incidence of uh, heart disease. So the question becomes, if animal fats have all these nutrients in them, and if fatty animal foods like egg yolks and hard cheese are capable of preventing heart disease, how is it we got to this idea that you have high cholesterol, you should avoid all these foods with fat-soluble vitamins in them? Make sure you stay away from the hard cheese and the egg yolks that have all the vitamin K2. How did we get to that point? Well, we got to this point that high blood cholesterol levels caused by saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet lead to heart disease. Now, the pop version of, of, this, uh, of this hypothesis, called the lipid hypothesis, is, well, animal fats are hard, and they're sticky and they're gooey. So if they're hard and they're sticky and they're gooey outside your body, they're going to be hard and sticky and gooey inside your body. And since your arteries are kind of like pipes, and we all know that grease clogs up pipes, they're going to clog up your arteries. Okay, the most obvious problem with that is that your body's 98.6 degrees, and if you have a stick of butter out at room temperature, when room temperature is 65 degrees, it might be hard, but it's not hard once it gets to 98.6 degrees. So even coconut oil, which is the most saturated fat on the planet, is a complete liquid um, when you get to 80 degrees, never mind 90, 98 degrees. Um, but in reality, this doesn't even remotely resemble the lipid hypothesis that actual scientists believe in. So if you look at this picture, you can see these blue, this blue line of cells, uh, this is an arterial plaque, and this is the blood vessel right here. This blue line of cells on the top is called the endothelium, and that's the inside lining that has contact with the blood. This arterial plaque is occurring behind the endothelium, so it's occurring inside the blood vessel wall. So it's nothing at all like, uh, like plaque, I mean like grease clogging up a pipe. The other thing is... Um, all this cholesterol and fat is getting loaded into these wh white blood cells that turn into what we call foam cells because they have a foamy appearance. Um, and so there's a very uh, biological process here. Uh, it isn't anything like gre grease just kind of clogging up a pot pipe. It's a very dynamic biological process. Now, the actual lipid hypothesis goes, and in its current form, goes like this. High concentrations of LDL associated cholesterol, LDL and HDL are both lipoproteins that carry cholesterol in the blood. High concentrations of LDL associated cholesterol are uh, delivered to the um, extrahepatic tissues, meaning away from the liver, so tissues like the blood vessel. And as the concentration drives up in the blood so high, they start to leak through the blood vessel wall, and then they start to load up into these white blood cells. And then those lipid-loaded white blood cells uh, start to promote the process of inflammation. And then uh, another part of that hypothesis is that HDL, which carries cholesterol to the liver, is uh, responsible for protecting against this effect by carrying all the cholesterol out to the liver. Now, this can be separated from the diet-heart hypothesis, which is built on top of the lipid hypothesis. The lipid hypothesis is about blood levels of lipids. The diet-heart hypothesis says it's saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet that increase those cholesterol levels in the blood, uh, and specifically the LDL levels, and therefore cause heart disease. Now, in order to understand um, exactly how these theories developed and where they went wrong, we need to go back and look at the original evidence. Now, early in the 20th century, the cholesterol-fed rabbit model was the first piece of evidence that supported the lipid hypothesis. Uh, scientists, Russian scientists were trying to investigate the idea that protein causes aging, and atherosclerosis was associated with aging. So they started feeding protein foods like meat, milk, uh, egg yolks, eggs, uh, ox brain, and all kinds of different foods and they saw that atherosclerosis developed in these rabbits. So they tried to narrow it down to uh, what was the component that was causing um, the atherosclerosis, and they concluded that pure cholesterol dissolved in sunflower oil was capable of inducing atherosclerosis in these animals. And they found characteristics that were uh, very much like human atherosclerosis, um, maybe a little bit different, but very much like human atherosclerosis in most of the major characteristics. And in other animals, of course, rabbits never eat meat. In other animals, like dogs, for example, that do eat meat, 
they found that feeding cholesterol wouldn't induce atherosclerosis, but the main reason was because the cholesterol levels in the blood were never increasing because the dog was very efficient at converting all this cholesterol to bile acids. So if they inhibited thyroid hormone in the dogs, which is important to make bile acids out of the cholesterol, then the blood lipids would go up and the dogs would get atherosclerosis. So they found that across all these animals, if they increased the levels of uh, blood cholesterol in, uh, in the animal, then they would develop atherosclerosis. Another important finding was that xanthomas, which were these bulky buildups of something in the joints, the tendons, eyelids, and so on, were associated with heart problems. And then that they were associated with high blood cholesterol levels, and then the finding that they were loaded up with cholesterol levels. So this, again, associated um, indirectly hypercholesterolemia with, um, with heart disease. Now, it turns out that these people have something called familial hypercholesterolemia. And researchers in the 1970s, Dan, uh, Joseph Goldstein and Michael Brown, discovered the LDL receptor and discovered that familial hypercholesterolemia was a defect in the LDL receptor. And the LDL receptor is what carries LDL from outside the cell inside the cell and delivers its contents to the cell. And they said, well, the only thing that's changing when you have a defect in the LDL receptor is that the LDL level in the blood is increasing. It's not making it into the cell. And since when it does, make, when it does bring the cholesterol into the cell, the cell just stops synthesizing as much cholesterol. So the cholesterol concentration in here never changes, and all the cholesterol just builds up out of the cell. And they said, aha, this basically proves that the only thing going on in hypercholesterolemia is that the blood levels of cholesterol are going up in the blood. Now, we'll see that this is false uh, in a few moments, but we'll go on with the story from here and come back to that thought. There was further epidemio epidemiological evidence that suggested high blood cholesterol levels were associated with atherosclerosis. You can see here in the Framingham study, um, this uh, solid line are people that are free of heart disease, and it's actually, uh, it's, these are the percentages of people rather than absolute numbers. So this curve, if it were absolute numbers of people, would be eight times larger than it is. Um, this curve with the dotted line here is the people who have heart disease. And along the horizontal axis are their blood uh, levels of cholesterol. And you can see a couple things. First of all, the people with heart disease are shifted slightly to the right. So there's a slight increase in blood cholesterol levels. One way to look at this is, well, most of this area here is overlapped. So for the most part, people have heart disease or they don't, and they have mostly the same blood cholesterol levels. You can also see this gap over here where the only people who have cholesterol levels down here below 150 are people who don't have heart disease. And you can barely see it in the picture because there are so few people, but all of the people who um, who have cholesterol levels up above this 300, 350 range do have heart disease. They're all part of the dotted line. So there are a couple things you can learn from that, um, from, from this graph. Now, all these people up here are the people who have familial hypercholesterolemia. So it's not just that they have high blood cholesterol levels, it's that they have this genetic defect. A lot of these people down here might be people that have a defect in the degradation of the LDL receptor, which is the exact opposite defect. And we're finding now that people who have high expression of the LDL receptor because of certain genes have an 88% reduced risk of heart disease. So these people over here that have the gen genetic defect that stops the LDL receptor from working, if they have two copies of that gene, they can have heart attacks at the age of two. These people over here who have a genetic defect that increases the expression of the LDL receptor, uh, they have virtually complete abolition of the risk of heart disease. So the LDL receptor is very important to the risk of heart disease, uh, but as we'll see, the idea that it's just blood cholesterol levels in the, in the blood that change is very wrong. But going on further with the story, the 1984 uh, coronary primary prevention trial was the trial where the NIH went out to prove that lowering blood cholesterol levels would uh, prevent heart disease. Now, they used a drug called cholesteramine, which binds bile acids and causes them to be excreted from the body. And when bile acids are excreted from the body, the liver converts more cholesterol to bile acids. 
So the concentration of cholesterol in the liver goes down, and the liver says, hey, I need more cholesterol, and it increases its expression of the LDL receptor, which takes in LDL from the blood. So again, what we're looking at with this particular drug is increasing the LDL receptor activity. And cholesterimine happens to be a really nasty drug that's a very thick powder. You have to take scoops and scoops and scoops of it, and it binds up everything in, in your intestines, and it gives you gastrointestinal disorders. So as a result, and of course they had to make the placebo just the same, <laughs> as a result, uh, there was very low compliance. But they were keeping track, they, they had to go to the nurse every week to take these packets home, and they were keeping track of how many packets they took so they could measure their compliance. And when they had, when they had the people with poor compliance, or the, the average in the total study, and compared it to the people who had good compliance, they could see a dose-response relationship where the more cholesterol they took, the more they lowered their blood cholesterol level by increasing the LDL receptor, the greater their reduction in heart disease. Then the statins came out, and the statins, like Lipitor, for example, also lowered blood cholesterol levels, and in this case, by inhibiting cholesterol synthesis. But when you inhibit cholesterol synthesis in the liver, the cholesterol in the liver goes down, the liver says, hey, I need more, uh, more cholesterol, and increases its expression of the LDL receptor, and the LDL receptor takes more LDL in from the blood. So these drugs, again, are just increasing expression of the LDL receptor and not necessarily only lowering uh, cholesterol. And of course, statins have other positive effects that uh, I'm not going to have time to go into today um, that also help lower heart disease. But in any case, the lipid hypothesis say, look at this graph. The, all the trials that lowered um, cholesterol a lot, lowered uh, heart disease a lot, and the ones that lowered cholesterol a little, lowered heart disease a little, and again, you see this relationship. The more they lower the cholesterol level, the more successful they are at uh, preventing heart disease. Now, let's look at the evidence for the diet heart hypothesis. The diet heart hypothesis says, look, we know that high blood cholesterol levels are tied to heart disease. We know that saturated fat and cholesterol raise these cholesterol levels, that polyunsaturated fat lowers the cholesterol levels, Thus, all we need to know is that if you eat saturated fat, you'll get heart disease. If you eat lots of polyunsaturated fat from vegetable oils, you'll get protection from heart disease. Ansel Keys had initiated this hypothesis back in the 1960s by showing that if he plotted six countries by their fat intake on a graph, there was a clear line showing that the more fat they took in, the higher their risk of heart disease. The problem with this was that there were 22 countries that had data, data available, and he ignored uh, 16 of them. So if you plot all these countries here, you can see that there's no relationship. It's scattered all over the place. Look at this dot down here, this dot up here. Same fat intake, dramatically different, uh, dramatic difference in the heart disease levels. Another problem was that there are many populations that have high saturated fat intakes and don't have any heart disease at all. The Maasai are, are a great example. They subsist mostly on milk, blood, and meat. Their milk has three times more fat than American whole milk has, and milk is one of the most saturated fats that's on the market, with the exception of coconut oil. They have the lowest cholesterol levels in the world. The more exclusively they eat the meat, blood, and milk, the lower their cholesterol levels are, and they have been studied and shown to not have any incidence at all of heart disease in terms of an actual myo myocardial infarction or heart attack, at least in 50 post-mortem uh, hearts and aortas that were studied, meaning that if they, have, if they die of heart attacks, the rate is under 2%. Now, studies had shown, and this is perhaps the one bit of evidence that could possibly be construed to support the diet heart hypothesis. Studies showed that if you had a very controlled laboratory experiment where you fed this pre-designed milkshake, and you took the fat out of it, and you put in either vegetable oil containing polyunsaturated fat, uh, which I'll call PUFAs from now on, or saturated fat from an animal fat, the animal fat would lead to high cholesterol levels, and the PUFAs would lead to low cholesterol levels. So why bother studying whether that prevents heart disease? We already know that high levels of cholesterol in the blood cause heart disease. Therefore, obviously, eating animal fat causes heart disease. Well, there's a problem with that. And that problem is that it's completely untrue that all of these drugs and all of these genetic defects are only affecting the level of LDL in the blood. 
There was an interesting finding that was very critical to the development of the Lippitt hypothesis in the late 1970s and then going further on into the 1980s. And they said, if we really want to quench this, we need to show how does the LDL actually get into those foam cells. And what they showed was that, first of all, if they incubated the LDL with endothelial cells, which are the cells that line the, love, uh, the lining of the blood vessel and have contact with the blood, if they incubated the LDL in isolated endothelial cells, something about the LDL changed. They didn't know what it was, but something changed that allowed it to get taken up into these macrophages, which are the white blood cells that turn into foam cells that populate the atherosclerotic plaque. They didn't know what it was at first, so they called this endothelial cell modified LDL. But when they compared regular LDL to endothelial cell modified LDL, you can see that very quickly the LDL uptake plateaus. Now the normal level of LDL in the blood is somewhere over here. So if you look at two points on this, for example, you go from 10 to 50, when really in the actual person you're looking at levels of 980 or so, you can see that increasing the concentration fivefold, what does it do to the amount of LDL taken up by the macrophage? It doesn't do anything at all, right? There's virtually no difference between these two levels, even, even though there's five times much here. So the idea that the concentration of LDL in the blood is causing the macrophage to take up the LDL and cause the atherosclerotic plaque is obviously not true because the amount of LDL has nothing to do with the amount of LDL the macrophage takes up. Why? The macrophage takes up the LDL, gets the cholesterol, says, I have enough cholesterol, stops putting LDL receptors on the cell surface. Now this endothelial cell modified LDL, first of all, if you look at the same concentration in the blood, if it's endothelial cell modified, you get, uh, you get, you know, a 50-fold increase, or in this example, you have a five-fold increase uh, in the rate of LDL uptake and the amount of LDL that's taken up into the macrophages when you didn't change the concentration of all at all. Not only, not only that, but this uh, curve never really stops and it keeps on going like this. Now, what it turned out was that the LDL was oxidizing, meaning it was going bad. So if you have food that goes bad because you left it out, especially food that's rich in polyunsaturated fats, like vegetable oil, leave it out on the counter, open the cap, let it sit there for a week, it's going to stink. That's what's happening to the, to the LDL. It's, and that's a process called oxidation. So they found that when the LDL oxidizes, the macrophage says, hey, this is something really nasty. I don't want it lying around in the blood where it can damage DNA and proteins and everything going wrong. So the macrophage has what's called a scavenger receptor and says, we need to mop up this mess. So the macrophage comes in and cleans up the, the oxidized LDL so it doesn't do worse damage to other cells. In the, process, in the process, the oxidized LDL accumulating in the foam cells does cause harm. It, cause, it attracts white blood cells and roots them in the blood vessel walls so they accumulate the oxidized LDL. It causes the secretion of enzymes that degrade the fibrous, plaque, uh, the fibrous cap of the atherosclerotic plaque, leading it to rupture. It inhibits uh, nitric oxide, which is important to pre prevent blood clotting. So when that plaque ruptures, you get a huge blood clot that can lead to a heart attack. So now that we know that it's the oxidation of the LDL and not the concentration of the LDL that matters, let's revisit the question of what happens in familial hypercholesterolemia. Well, let's draw an analogy to a traffic jam. What are some of the things that happen if you're jammed in traffic? Okay, why does the car overheat? Okay, so the car is sitting there, right? What happens to the concentration of cars in the road? It increases, right? Is that the only thing that happens in a traffic jam? Okay, right, so it's not the only thing, right? What, how long does it take you to get home in a traffic jam, more or less time? More time, right? You're stuck in the road. Well, likewise, in familial hypercholesterolemia, when the LDL receptor isn't there to take the LDL up into the cells, the concentration of LDL rises in the blood, and the LDL is therefore present in the blood for a longer period of time. When the LDL is present in the blood for a longer period of time, 
it's present. It's just like when they incubated it in the endothelial cells for a long period of time. What happens to it? It interacts with free radicals and it becomes oxidized. So we know that all these drugs that increase LDL receptor activity, which by the way have nasty side effects as well, but they do seem to lower heart disease risk. And we know that genetic defects that increase LDL receptor activity dramatically increase heart disease risk. And if they, uh, I'm sorry, if they increase LDL receptor activity, they virtually abolish heart disease risk. And if they lower LDL receptor activity, they uh, increase heart disease risk to the point where you can have a heart attack at the age of two. So in the general population, what determines LDL receptor activity? Well, there are probably a number of things that we don't know, but the main thing that stimulates LDL receptor activity is thyroid hormone. And we have another lecture uh, this weekend on thyroid hormone, so that'll be really interesting to connect to this big picture. It's also inhibited by oxidation of the LDL. So here we have a vicious cycle. If we don't have enough thyroid hormone, that LDL doesn't make it into the cell, so it stays in the blood and it oxidizes. If the LDL oxidizes, it can't get taken up into the cell because it can't interact with the LDL receptor, so it stays in the blood and it oxidizes further. So we have a vicious cycle here between oxidation, low thyroid hormone activity, and any of the other contributors to low LDL receptor activity. But what's going on, and does it have anything to do with LDL cholesterol? Well, this is the LDL particle. Here you have proteins, and the proteins are what interact with the LDL receptor and allow it to get taken into the cell. You have most of the cholesterol, fats, and fat-soluble vitamins at the core. You have a few pieces of free cholesterol in the membrane, and you have these things called phospholipids that form the membrane. Phospholipids contain two fatty acids. Some of those fatty acids will be polyunsaturated. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, are the ones that you mostly get from vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are the ones that, when, you sit, when they sit out on your counter for a week with the cap off, they go rancid. You put coconut oil that has saturated fat in it, put that out for three years, and it won't go rancid. So it's these PUFAs in the LDL membrane that lead to the oxidation. Once they oxidize, they contribute to the oxidation of the protein, and then they can contribute to the oxidation of the cholesterol. And if you look at the modern textbook, Modern Nutrition, Health, and Disease, which is a very up-to-date textbook that's very well respected in the nutrition community, they say oxidized LDL rather than LDL per se is now regarded as a prime inducer of the atherosclerotic process. Then they go on to say, nutrition and biochemical studies suggest a diet can modulate the susceptibility of plasma LDLs to oxidative degradation by altering the concentration of PUFAs and antioxidants in the lipoprotein particle. The first target of peroxidation in the oxidation of LDLs consists of PUFAs on the LDL surface. Nowhere do they say, well, we should all eat saturated fat instead of PUFAs, uh, but that's the obvious conclusion here, because it's the PUFAs in the LDL particle that are contribu to, contributing to the oxidation. Studies with animals show that if you substitute corn oil for coconut oil, you get increased oxidation. Studies in humans show that if you substitute vegetable oils or fish oils for oils rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, then you get increased LDL oxidation. Studies that were swept underneath the rug in the 1960s showed that if you gave people corn oil or even olive oil instead of animal fat, it increased their risk of heart disease, even though lowering their cholesterol levels. In the first study they ever did, corn oil increased the rate of heart disease by uh, four times, and they swept it under the rug and ignored it. There were other studies that were done that uh, reduced non-fatal heart disease, but increased fatal heart disease just as much. They didn't talk about the fatal heart disease. They could have said, well, it looks like the same number of people are having heart attacks and more people are dying, but instead they said, aha, we've reduced non-fatal heart attacks, and left it at that. So all these findings got swept under the rug. You may have heard of the French paradox. The French eat a real lot of butter and have a real low risk of heart disease. Well, in 2004, Harvard School of Public Health and some other collaborating institutions did a study that the editors of the journal called the American Paradox. And they found that the more saturated fat that postmenopausal women ate, the lower their progression of atherosclerosis. And in the highest intake of saturated fat, the atherosclerosis reversed. They found that consumption of PUFAs had the exact opposite association. The more they ate, the more progression they had. And they found that an increased in intake of carbohydrate was much less harmful than PUFAs, but was still associated with increased risk. This makes you wonder whether it's not a paradox at all, and the French just have low rates of heart disease because they eat so much butter. 
Studies with eggs show that uh, they have little or no effect on cholesterol levels in most people, even if you consume three to four a day. By this, even by the mainstream conventional wisdom that the LDL to HDL ratio is the main determinant of heart disease, they don't change it in the 30% of people whose cholesterol levels they do increase. They shift LDL from pattern B, which is small and dense and likely to oxidize, to pattern A, which is large and fluffy and not likely to oxidize. People with pattern A have three times lower risk of heart disease than people with pattern B. They enrich the lipoproteins with carotenoids, which protect against oxidation. So clearly, saturated fat and cholesterol are not the culprits in heart disease. Rather, animal fats, especially liver and cod liver oil, eggs, mil milk and cheese, meat, and especially organ meats, are, should be seen as very nutrient-dense foods. And the real heart-healthy diet is the one where we avoid oxidation-prone vegetable oils, where we get the nutrients we need for our th from our thyroid gland and avoid the things that harm our thyroid gland, where we get vitamin K2-rich foods like hard cheese, egg yolks, fermented foods, grass-fed animal fats, foods that are rich in oxidant, antioxidants, especially fresh foods, organ meats, especially heart for coenzyme Q10, which protects LDL from oxidation, and also homocysteine levels can aggravate the effect of oxidized LDL by harming the blood vessels directly, and we need shellfish, liver, leafy greens, bananas, and so on to get B12, B6, and folate uh, to help with that as well. So this is what a real heart healthy uh, diet looks like. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, feel free to visit my website and ask any questions now. So thank you very much. OK, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, I've, I've, he, uh, right behind her, and then she had raised her hands. Uh, those two of them had raised their hands first. The guy in the green shirt. He can just ask a question. I can repeat it into my microphone if you want. My question was, uh, yeah, I think, I think there, there is a distinction. I don't think that the distinction is uh, necessarily very important for, um, yeah, the question is, does it matter if the eggs and milk are raw or cooked? Uh, I consume raw milk. I think there are a lot of benefits to raw milk. I think there are a lot of benefits to consuming raw egg yolks as well. Uh, raw protein is actually good for preventing oxidation because uh, it's a very good way of getting uh, cysteine, bioavailable cysteine for synthesizing glutathione, which is the man master antioxidant of the cell. So I think those are really important in that sense. Um, I haven't seen any good evidence yet that cooking those foods will necessarily uh, cause changes that will make them atherogenic, um, but I do think that eating those foods raw is very valuable. The woman in front had a, a, a question also. You? Oh. Where's the microphone? Oh, yeah, just ask it and I'll repeat it. Yeah. Uh, you would ha well, you would have to suspect it, and then you could get a genetic test done. So if you had unusually high cholesterol levels, you, you could ask your doctor to run a test, and they would do a genetic test uh, for one of the known defects. Okay, the question is, why did this happen? Yeah, 
Okay. So the question is, why, despite all the evidence, do do we necessarily, uh, nevertheless, embrace the wrong ideas? Uh, well, I think there are a few things. I mean, there's there are politics and money issues. Uh, for example, the American Heart Association in the ni early 1960s had said that this uh, cholesterol theory was a load of junk and there was n uh, hardly any evidence to support it. And then a few years later, they came out with the same report. The evidence hadn't changed and they said the exact opposite and embraced it. Well, what happened was the board, uh, the, the, the panel that, was, that were writing the reports had different people on it. And Ansel Keys and his friends got onto the panel and, uh, and they changed the report and and that's what happened. Uh, the other thing is the cholesterol lowering drugs proved to be incredibly profitable, so there was that issue. Uh, but there are also a number of other issues. Uh, just the, Mc the McGovern panel uh, in Gary Tobbs' uh, article, what, what if it was all a big fat lie, he talked to some of the people who were on the McGovern committee who gave the original federal government endorsement to the low fat, low cholesterol diet, and they said, well, we just were young kids and we needed something to do, so we wanted the panel just to, you know, come up with more findings that we could be really active about. And, uh, and for them, it was just a big project that they wanted to work on and didn't really necessarily have anything to do with the evidence. It was just, it facilitated an activist government because it allowed them to say, look, there's this huge problem that everyone's eating wrong, so we need to have a big government program to change the way people eat. Uh, so there's that issue too. And then there's just the issue of, uh, you know, the scientific paradigm. Some people just get wrapped up in ideas and they get wrapped up in their own ideas so they selectively look at the evidence. So uh, we have, yeah. oh, we're out of time. So any further uh, questions can be uh, directed to me afterwards or to my website. You can contact me through there. So thank you very much.